I'm Mike DeLuca. Welcome to this rare, in-the-trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today we're here with Stuart Beatty, whose intense script for the thriller Collateral reinvented the hitman genre. His other work includes the original screenplay for the blockbuster Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, and the indie thriller Durrell. Welcome, Stuart. Thanks for being with us. Oh, thanks very much for having me, Mike. It's good to be here. Now, is it true you started writing about 15 years ago? But yeah, I did, yeah. Um, I was wanting to break into the movie industry and I was told the person who has the best script you know, is king and you can be nobody and have a good script and you can get work. So Who told you that? <laughs> some, I don't know, I kind of okay. remember now. Um, but uh, that was the advice I got and so I started reading the script, started writing. Now this was back in Australia? This was actually, uh, yeah it was, uh, 1989, 1990. Uh, I was going to college and I had some ideas for movies and mm -hmm. so I started yeah, just started writing them. Uh, now you were you're born in Melbourne, but then... Born in Melbourne, raised in Sydney, and then I was... Uh, actually, I'd, I got an exchange uh, to Oregon State University, mm -hmm. and I thought I was in Hollywood, and it was fantastic. Right coast. Right, exactly. Off. And everyone told me I was in the sticks, and I had right. to go to L.A., and so I went back and finished my degree, and... Uh, started and then came right back over as soon as I'd finished my degree in Australia and moved to LA and, and started studying and, and writing and working then. Okay, when, so when, when did you start writing? 91. Okay. 1991 was when I first wrote what became Collateral and Pirates. Okay, and how many, did you write a lot of screenplays before the, the kind of breakthrough in Hollywood? Oh yeah, yeah, about a dozen at least. And lots and lots and lots and lots of drafts of that dozen. <laughs> yeah. Did that basically fill up kind of the intervening years between the Yeah, it kept and... me busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that and, yeah, just reading everything, reading every script I could. I was a reader for a long time. Okay. Uh, so, you know, professionally analyzing scripts, that was a big help because, you know, you kept seeing the same seven mistakes by, you know, everybody. Right. So it helps you avoid those mistakes. And, and I just kept writing and writing and writing and writing. And uh, finally, I think it was about eight years, like 1999, I, I really... Start, I, since 1999, I haven't, I've, I've been writing for a living. Do you find that reading other writers or, or just kind of like absorbing films and, and screenplays is a good way to, to kind of learn the craft? Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, you've got, it's like any profession, I would imagine. You want to be a doctor, you study great doctors. You, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a writer, so I studied great writers, great films, you know, films that I thought were great. I got a hold of the scripts and I read and read and read and read. It was the best training for me. I mean, I went through film school, I did screenwriting school, but the best thing for me was reading other scripts mm -hmm. and, uh, and then writing and writing and writing. Was there a favorite writer that kind of was an inspiration? Oh, lots. Uh, Larry Kasdan was probably the biggest. Um, I even got to talk to him. Uh, my, my wife used to do his wife's makeup. And so. There you go. You had an in. <laughs> yeah, I had an in, right. Um, yeah, Larry Kasdan, I, I just thought was just fantastic uh, with Empire and Body Heat mm -hmm. and Big Chill and Bodyguard, and, you know, I just loved all his films and just thought his writing was fantastic. In fact, one of my earliest memories uh, is watching Raiders and seeing screenplay by Larry Kasdan and wondering right. what a screenplay is. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, he was certainly the number one. There was also Frank Darabont. There was also uh, Bill Nicholson, Steve Zalian. Was your admiration of Frank's work what got you? Frank to be a producer on Collateral? No, it just turned out that way. Um, I knew his fiance and pitched it to her. Uh, I was waiting tables, actually, in the deli, and she was a customer. Oh, you were waiting tables here? Yeah, in, in LA. LA. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I had one of those awkward moments where it's like, oh, God, do I go up and just say, hi, I'm waiting tables, or? You did not pitch collateral as a did, waiter. To... as a waiter. <laughs> as a waiter to a friend I'd known at UCLA. Wow. Yeah, and... Uh, did she tip you? <laughs> no, actually, it wasn't my table. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. I, yeah, I, I stole it on someone else's table. You were but, out of control. But they didn't have a movie to, mm -hmm. to pitch. Um, so, yeah, so I pitched it to her, and, uh, and she came back and said, hey, he likes it. Uh, she, Frank had a deal right. uh, at the time with uh, HBO to make Friday Night Thrillers. Mm -hmm. and so so was, Collateral is one of those uh, projects that began life as one thing and then eventually became this yeah. incredible A-list blockbuster. Yeah, it began as, it was a film called The Last Domino. It actually, was, it began as a film called Fiend. It was the first ever pitch I ever did. It was in Australia, and uh, I think I was just out of high school, and the only person I knew in the film business was a friend of mine's father. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember pitching, I went in and I wrote a two-page outline, and I pitched it to this guy, and he listened, and he was really nice, and he said, wow, that sounds great, but I, I'm in distribution. I, <laughs> right. I don't buy, I, don't, I can't do anything with it, so... Good luck, right? You know, but I just thought, well, he's in film, so he could do something. So, was it one of those compelling ideas that just you know yeah. stayed with you over the years? And yeah, I caught a ride in the back of a cab uh, one day, and I just started chatting with the cab driver, and I just thought, this is so bizarre that um, 
you know, two complete strangers can get in a very you know, close proximity with each other mm -hmm. and trust each other implicitly. I mean, everything you get taught, the two rules you get taught as a kid, um, don't get in the car with strangers and never pick up a hitchhiker. Right. Well, that's the essence of cabs, right? Right. So that just seemed like a great setting for drama. And I just thought, you know, I was chatting with this guy and I was like, man, I could be some homicidal maniac sitting back here and you'd have no idea. Right. And I could, you know, pull a gun on you or do anything right now. And, and it it just... Who knew? Like years later, knew? Tom right. Cruise plays you. <laughs> right, exactly. Tom Cruise. During those beginning years, was there a specific moment where you thought, I can do this, I, you, where your confidence came into its own and you, you decided the screenwriting thing is going to work out for me? No, no, it was more I have to do this and I don't know what the hell I'm going to do if I don't. Right. So it was really driven by that more than anything else. I never had the great confidence I'm such a great writer, oh, it's going to happen. It's just like right. I cannot see myself doing anything else, so I'm going to devote myself to this and work, 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 mm -hmm. work until I freaking get there. So there was no moment where the, the converse happened where you thought, I might jump ship, this isn't no. working out great? No, I, you know, and I had the visa thing too hanging over my head because I'm from Australia mm -hmm. and I could only stay here a certain amount of time. So I had like a, you know, the guillotine coming down on me, you know, within two years and I had to do it. Right. You know, oh, so there was a real... Amount. Yeah, there was a real, I was getting kicked out of the country otherwise unless I could, you know, earn the money to stay. So it, uh, I had the real pressure cooker going and uh, I think that actually helped me a lot because it really helped the drive, you know. Right. In, in the low periods, the slow periods, it, you know, I've got to make this happen or else I'm on a plane. Right. Was there anything in your background that you feel uh, helped prepare you for a life as a screenwriter? Um, just that I love movies. Right. I, you know, from Star Wars, from the time I was six, I just loved, loved movies and I absorbed them and, and saw them again and again and again and, and just had a genuine passion for them. Um, you know, I, I ended up writing stories in, in like third grade and fourth grade, you know, like 50, 100 page stories, things like that, that I, right. I look back on now, I think, oh, okay, well, I was kind of telling stories then, but nothing that I thought of at the time. I always had ideas, I guess, mm -hmm. but I think it was really just a love of films. I know we talked about reading screenplays, other writers' works and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Did the UCLA extension program serve a purpose? Uh, UCLA was great because it, it was taught by working professionals. Mm -hmm. you know, they weren't really college professors. There were right. people out there every day doing this who were at night coming in to kind of give back. Right. And, then, and they had all their screenwriting buddies who were out there in the trenches. Oh, that's great. So like, we got Gary Ross to come in and talk to us the week Dave came out. We had Dave Kep come in and talk to us the week Jurassic Park came out. Mm -hmm. And it was so that uh, must have been very inspiring. invaluable oh, and totally inspiring. And uh, you've you got that one-on-one -on -one with the people who are really out there. And you're in a small room, 12 people, and, and David Kep. It's fantastic. Right. Um, so that was invaluable. And then they had an award there every year, which I won. And that got me my first agent, and that really jump-started my career. So that really helped, too. So it was invaluable, yeah. The stuff I learned in the classes, I don't know if I still use it today or not. Right. But the, it was the connections I made. I mean, the, the woman I sold, the producer of Collateral, that I sold that pitch to, I met in one of those classes. Okay, so it was know? pretty instrumental. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, your, your taste seems to be pretty eclectic in terms of the stories you like to tell. Um, do you, when you sit down, do you differentiate between this is going to be a smaller film or this is going to be a giant blockbuster like, like a Pirates or right. a Collateral? No, I don't actually. No, I just think story is story. And genre-wise, size-wise, it doesn't really occur to me. It's just, oh, that would be a good idea for a good story. I like all kinds of films, so I want to tell all kinds of stories, I guess. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it runs the gamut. I've written animated right. musicals, and then right. I've written, you know, Rwanda genocide, you know, so right. it just, it's just whatever, you know, uh, tickles my fancy, I guess. And I don't know what that is from one thing to the next. I right. just know a good story, well, what I think is a good story when I see it. Do you admire the, the, the careers that have been more eclectic, not focused on yeah. one genre? Is yeah. that something you'd like to, to Absolutely. see for yourself? Yeah, well, I hate the whole pigeonhole thing, right. you know. So I really do, when I'm looking for projects, I really look to do something that I've never done before, or a genre I've never done, or a type of story I've never done, because I never want to be boxed in. And I, I think the writers who do one kind of thing, you know, they can do it well, but I think after a while they get bored, right. and they look for something else to do. And it's natural, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I don't think, you know, anyone can tell one kind of story. I mean, even Stephen King wrote Shawshank, and... Right you know, at pupil and, you know, all these other things. Sure. You, know, you can do different things. I think storytellers, good storytellers are good storytellers, mm -hmm. not great thriller writers or great comedy writers. Right. You know, I think you can, you know, it's, it's more of a broad thing than that. Can you walk us through your general writing process? Like, do you begin with an outline or do you just kind of... Yeah, I like outlines a lot. It, uh, I usually actually try and do a five-page outline. And Act One's one page, Act Two is two, three, four, and Act Three is... Uh, page five, because mm -hmm. I know if I can boil it down to that essence, then I've got what is the story, 
and it's not confused with a bunch of muddling subplots. So yeah, work from an outline and then, uh, but I, I don't like to do like the 40 page outline because then I think that takes away some of my creativity in the right. moment of writing the script. So I just uh, I do the five pager and then let it go from there. And is that five pager something uh, the studio never sees or that? No, I give them everything okay. because I've sat in too many rooms with people where we've both talked for an hour right. about the, what we think is the same film and then I deliver a draft, which is what I thought we talked about. Right. And they're like, what the hell is this? We didn't talk about this. So I just think two people can sit in a room and talk about completely different movies and not know it. So I try and keep the studio, wherever I'm working for, as informed as possible about what I'm doing. So if they have a problem along the way, they can say, hey, I thought it was more this or more that. Or at least they're not getting the draft and going, I'm shocked. Or they right. can't be shocked because I say, well, you saw it in the outline. Right. You know, so I, I do try and keep them. I think it's a, a duty, a job. You know, one of the responsibilities you have as a writer just to keep those people you're working for informed. Have you had both kinds of experiences where you, you thought you were on the same page and then after the draft was delivered, there was controversy? Yes, lots of controversy, yes. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, early in my career, I don't get it so much nowadays because right. I'm much more clear and I can actually uh, talk better in a room about what I'm gonna do and, what, and, and that kind of stuff. Right. Like, develop that language better, I think, where I can communicate better. You know, half the job of screenwriting today is communication in a room. You've got to be able to mm -hmm convey your vision, convey your ideas, and, and make people believe in what you're doing. Otherwise, you know, right. they're not going to buy it when they read it. And do they treat you differently now that you're, you're established? And oh, God, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny. Uh, I remember I was, I was working on some story, and I was trying to say, the villain's got to be bigger. Mm -hmm. you know, the better the villain, the better the story, because the better the obstacle the hero's got right. to overcome. And they're like, no, 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 no. And then Collateral came out. And like the next week, they're like, yeah, good villain, good villain, <laughs> right. we should do a good villain. You know? So yeah, you certainly do, you do see a, a huge change. People believe you more, right. basically, because you start to have a track record. Right. You know, I didn't change that much, but you know, I had a film come out and you right. know, people liked it and that kind of thing. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a sea change. Is there a, a more difficult part of writing a screenplay for you than other parts? Is there, is there a place where... Um, yeah. Lots of difficult, but it's all <laughs> difficult. Um, but a lot of the difficulty is before you ever get to a script. Right. And then there's a lot of difficulty after you've written the script. You know, actually writing the script, doing that first draft to me is the best part because it's the one time when nobody's going to mess with you and, mm -hmm. and you get to do what you want to do. Everything before then, everything after then is all answering to other people mm -hmm. and, and satisfying their bizarre whims or, right. you know, because they had a personal childhood with this happen in it and that makes them react this way to this part in right. your script and where did you get that? And, right. you know, you start digging it. So you've got to kind of tailor it more for the people you're really making it for. Right. And so it becomes less and less yours and more and more theirs. Hopefully it becomes better. Right. Most often not. Most of the time, just different. Right. Is the most dangerous part um, the part between turning it into a studio and before the director and the actors arrive, so it's just you in the studio and those lobbing in the notes and the ideas before kind of a, a filmmaker comes and guides the rest of the... Yeah, filmmakers mm -hmm. are, are usually your, your best allies because right. they get what you're trying to do right. a lot of the time, a lot better than uh, you know, junior executives, right. things like that. The senior executives, I find, are really good. Mm -hmm. They really know what they're doing. Once To get to that position, they've been through it right. and they've seen it and they know what this is. This is, you know, this is the reading draft, this is the studio draft, this is not the film draft. Right. That'll come later with a filmmaker and all that kind of stuff. So I find uh, the senior studio executives are really good right. allies. Yeah, that's been my experience anyway. What's your approach to editing your own work? Do you do a lot of internal drafts before someone sees it? Or? Yeah, I actually start every day at page one. Uh, it's probably not good, mm. but I end up, I, I just have to know everything I've written before is as good as I can make it before I write the next page right. because something might change that next page that I've written before. So uh, I do a lot of internal editing as I write it. So by the time I write Fade Out, I've gone through the script a hundred times probably right. already, you know. And then I sit it down for a week and do something else and then I come back and read it through and usually my, my shit detector's working pretty well by right. it. As well as it's gonna work, you know. Give it to you know, a friend, or give it to my agent, you know, right. give it to people that I trust, whose opinion I, I, I value, get their uh, thoughts, their input, and, uh, and then go through and polish it one more time. Now, yeah. do you have, is it true you have a journalism background? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, journalism degree. Uh -huh. you know, I, I grew up that's in a, a background. That's a background, <laughs> I guess, yeah. I, I actually, I did one journalism job. I, was, I, uh, I reported on the Academy Awards one year. Hard news. Hard news, <laughs> yeah. It basically meant I held my right. telephone up to the TV so they could play it on <laughs> right. the radio back in Australia. 
Um, but no, I, I grew up in, uh, you, know, uh, you know, film is a very, uh, you know, what do you really want to do, that kind of a thing. Right. You know, you know, I want to make films. Okay, well, really. Um, right. So I, I had to have a fallback. Uh, so I didn't, and of course there was no film school. There was one film school in the whole of Australia, and you had to be 22 to get in. And I was, uh, uh, well, I was 18 out of high mm -hmm. school and 21 out of college, so I failed the prerequisites, right. you know, right off the bat. But so I, I had this fallback of journalism because um, you could do film courses in a journalism course, mm -hmm. and so I did journalism. Does that come into play at all, or does it help you when you're doing research for <laughs> yeah, a, a project? Or well, you know what it does is it actually helps just in interviews and. Right. Uh, yeah, just stuff like I can talk. I know how to talk in sound bites. Is it helping you right now? I don't know. Hopefully. <laughs> All right, we'll talk I don't about know. that later. But yeah, if I'm doing like spot interviews, right. I can say things in sentences, and I can, you know, just crap mm -hmm. like that. But as far as research, no, I, I always, you know, used to love research and stuff. Right. In terms of outside input, when you're crafting a story, do you record people's conversations to get the cadence of? Dialogue? Do you use outside kind of materials or? Yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I'm a big belief in, you know, author, authority, um, authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, those those three words having the same Latin root, all that kind of stuff. Right. So, I believe in yeah, getting the the most I can from my research. Mm -hmm. You know, so that I am an actual expert on whatever world it is I'm talking about. Right. So yeah, I, I go record people, I can meet people, talk to people, read everything I can on it. Um, and that's a, lot, that's a lot of the fun, you mm -hmm. know, because you don't know what can happen in the world until you know the world inside right. out, you know? Um, so I, I think it's, it's essential. You, you're shortchanging yourself if you right. don't know everything. You, if you can't write a book on that world, you don't know it well enough. Right. Um, coming from Sydney, Australia, did that help or hurt your career? Did, was it, did it differentiate you and make it and make I think it did, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people didn't know I was Australian until, I, until they met them, until they'd read the script and asked to right. meet me. But I think what helped, I kind of said earlier, with, with having the time clock hanging over me, it gave me just this drive of, I've got to make it within this certain period. Mm -hmm. I, can't, you know, I can't just stay indefinitely. Right. You know? So I think it gave me that drive. And I think it also uh, just gave me an, just an outsider's perspective on everything mm -hmm. and uh, um, gave me more, I think, of a, just a different look right. at things. Um, and then you know, once people met me, I think it probably it might have helped to stay in their minds a bit because I had a funny accent and mm -hmm. I had some other stories other than right. growing up in LA or growing up somewhere here. Now, Collateral uh, eventually became one of Michael Mann's signature LA-based mm -hmm. crime dramas, mm -hmm. but was that your original choice for where that story was going to be No, set? New York. New I York. mean, you, you think cab movie, you think New York, right? right? So, uh, no. Mm -hmm. he, he made it LA because he loves LA. Mm -hmm. But you right. had the idea in Australia. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But even then, I was like, you know, it should New be York. New York. Mm -hmm. New York cabs, right. you know, it's a cab movie. Yeah, so, so it should be Robert De Niro too. Right. <laughs> we should discuss a scene that you chose as kind of an exemplary scene in that film. It's the scene where Vincent takes Max to the jazz club. The jazz club, sure. How did you approach the writing of a scene like that? Did you know in advance that that was going to be a pivotal, important yeah, actually, scene? Yeah, actually, that scene was modeled on two favorite scenes of mine. One is uh, from True Romance with Chris Walken and, mm -hmm. and Dennis Hopper. You know, they have this oh, sure. yeah. whole nice conversation, but you know he's yeah. going to kill him all the whole time. Yeah. And then... Uh, I love the moment in that scene where, where Hopper asks for the cigarette, because he, he knows, knows. That he's going to die. Might yeah. as well. One more, one more smoke. Yeah. And then the pantomimes. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the Luke Besson, Love Him, Nikita, when he, when he takes her to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, it's great. She's right. finally taking her out. And it's, here's the gun, and there are the people, and, da, 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 and the whole thing just changes on a dime. Right. I just loved those kinds of scenes, and mm -hmm. I wanted that kind of a scene in Collateral. Plus, I didn't want it to be one hit, next hit, next hit, next hit, next hit. Right. That's just boring. So it had to be, hey, let's go to a jazz club. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so that allowed me to get into that setup of, we think we're in somewhere else right now, but we're really still on the plot. Right. You know, I, I love those kinds of terms. Yeah. They kind of really, when I know when I'm watching a film, it really kind of grasps me and hooks me right in. So. No, it keeps the audience on their toes, too, because yeah, right. you really feel like in that scene, oh, well, maybe it's not going to be so bad. Maybe right. this guy and then maybe is going to get off. Kill him. Yeah. No way. No fucking chance. That, that guy's going down right. the second Vincent got contracted. So I just liked writing that kind of a scene where you thought it was one thing, sure. turns out to be something else, turns on that dime. And actually, if you, if you look back at the scene, look at it. Vincent's there checking out when everyone's leaving. And, and the whole way through, mm -hmm. he's, he's, it's never changing. Right. He's going to kill him. But uh, yeah, he kind of likes the guy. You right. know? So you get this. It just makes it more human, makes yeah. it more real. Now that scene manages to be scary, entertaining, frightening, and sad and dramatic, and all, all in the right. same scene. Right, exactly. Yeah, I remember at the premiere, some woman screamed when he shot her. Right. When he shot the guy, just 
Couldn't believe it. <laughs> now, um, in approaching a scene like that, do you, mm. do you come at it from this is the plot of the scene, or do you think about the theme, or the, just what's in the scene physically, or all at once? Yeah, no, I mainly go from, from characters first. Mm -hmm. Who are these people, and what the hell are they going to talk about, and why would they talk about it? Right. And we've set up, you know, this, this hitman has a love of jazz, and here's this great jazz player who has this great, fantastic story about one of the you know, right. jazz greats. And uh, so it really came from, and then what's, what's Max, the cab driver, doing that whole right. time? What's he trying to do? Well, he's just enjoying it. He's, he's doing this great story until he realizes what's really going on. Right. And then he's going to be, no, don't, don't, don't. You know, he's going to start to improvise. Right. That's the start of his growth, too, where he's starting to change, starting to be more like Vincent and less like right. rigid, structured Max. Yeah, so I really come at it from a character point of okay. view. You know, it's, very, I mean, it's, it's three people at a table, you know. Right. It's, it's good drama. Right. The character stuff will give you the best stuff out of that. When you're crafting a really a sociopathic or even psychopathic character like Vincent, how do you get inside the mind of someone like that? Um, it's a lot of research. I know being in Hollywood helps. <laughs> being in Hollywood yeah. helps. Knowing lots of sociopaths right. helps, helps. Studying what sociopathic behavior is mm -hmm. helps. Um, I, I read a lot about mercenaries because it's the okay. same kind of deal. You're, you're killing for money. Right. Lo uh, death is a way of life, all that kind of stuff. And I, I just find once I just get absorbed in it, I can start to kind of think like it mm -hmm. um, and, and get in those mindsets. The mindset's the most important thing for me. Being able to, to know exactly what your character would say to any moment or any question or any situation that arises. I think once you've got that, and if it's interesting, every, every answer, right. every moment, and every you know, reaction, then you've got a good character, I think. And then you can, you know, I mean, I could have written scenes and scenes and scenes and collateral with those right. people, you know, because I just sort of knew them so well after so many years of researching them and, and, and being with them, essentially, right. I guess. So why a jazz club? Did it come out of... Jazz was actually yeah. Frank. Frank Darabont is a huge oh, really? jazz fan, mm -hmm. yeah. And he's like, I'd like a jazz scene in here somewhere. Right. And I'm like, okay. And then it evolved from there, basically. Right. I had a hit. I had to kill someone. And I was like, well, let's have them into jazz. And oh, jazz can be all... You, know, you study jazz and you see, oh, jazz is all about just riffing, going with it. Well, that's right. really Vincent. And... So you, you, hey, I've already got Max listening to classical because he's so right. structured and rigid and this note, that note, that note. So that's interesting. You, back, you tied the suggestion yeah. from Frank into Vincent's character. Yeah, it's a good suggestion, yeah. The best suggestions are when you see, oh, I've already got other stuff in right. here that can play right into that really well, yeah. And then you researched um, for the Miles Davis trivia yeah. and all those things. Yeah, jazz, all that kind of Did stuff. Did you come out of it a jazz fan? Yeah, yeah, we went to jazz clubs. Right. We, we went researching in New York. We went to jazz clubs and, mm -hmm. oh, my God, the energy and the... Right. Oh, it, it, it's, it's just phenomenal. You, there's no other music like it because right. it's just riffing. Mm -hmm. They're just going. You don't know what you're going to hear. You're never going to hear it again either. Right. You know, it's, it, how often do you hear that? Well, know? the scene is also great because you feel like it establishes a new dynamic between Vincent and Max where, you know, Max probably feels like anything, like if there's any chance of getting out of this, it's this, right. this guy's not deviating from the path. Right. Was that like a goal for that scene as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, if, if you look at the, there's two killings before then. Mm -hmm. The first one happens completely away from Max. He's in his cab and the body falls down and he saw it. doesn't even see it happen. Right. The second one, he sees, well, the guy gets killed in the apartment, but he sees two guys killed 30 yards down the road. This one, he's sitting at a table. So he's get, gradually getting closer and closer and closer to the actual killing. Mm -hmm. And the point is, by that, at that point, when he's sitting right at the table with the guy, it's got to change for him. Mm -hmm. He can't go on like this anymore. And that's when he starts to get stronger and grow some balls and stand up to to Vincent more and more. You remember, he walks out of that club and he goes, I can't do this anymore, find someone else. Right. You know, I, I can't do this. The whole point of, you know, thematically what that film was all about is, you know, in a city of 30 million people, do you care if one person gets killed? Should you care? Right. Is a tree falling in a forest? Does anyone hear it? Right. You know, so the idea that he's kind of getting closer and closer and closer to these killings was, was a, a, a very important thematically. Mm -hmm as well as anything else. So uh, yeah, it was, it was very much planned that way. Now, I noticed in that scene, um, Felix is brought up. Um, yes. Uh, in the court case. Um, you a do little a, more information. Yeah, you do a great job of, of dropping exposition on the fly in a film that's very um, minimalist in terms of those, what, what are traditionally like very, could be very long yeah. and, and, and you know, long-winded expository scenes. Was that a consideration? How do I drop? the yeah. info, but keep the thing moving? Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of, of uh, simple stories, complex characters. I love when the story is get from here to here, right. or kill these five people. Or right. it, it allows, I know then I'll have room for great character stuff to go on. Mm -hmm. You know, the complicated plus, we have to do this to get that, to get this, to get that, it doesn't right. leave much time for me for character, so. So you I, like the breathing room? I like the breathing room, yeah, exactly. So I, I, I really minimalize the plot to, you know, I, I get, 
what's the very least I can mm -hmm. get away with so you're not scratching your head. Right. And then you just parcel that out in little bits and bits and pieces. Because mm -hmm. I hate the big long winded stop the story scene to explain what you need to know before we go on to the next scene. Right. I hate that. Uh, and it's always, and I know sometimes it's necessary and there's no mm -hmm. other way around it, but I really try and avoid it if right. I can. Um, so yeah, little bit, little bit, little bit. Right. And on, a, on a scene like this, do you know always how to begin and end it? Um, or do you do several stabs at it? Yeah, I mean, you know, the general rule is you start as late as possible and you end as soon as possible, mm -hmm. you know. Right. But sometimes you don't see that right away until you've been away from it for a while and you look back and you go, actually, mm -hmm. we don't really need to start till here. Nothing before this really makes sense right. or has that much effect on what, what goes on. So I just try and keep that general rule of thumb going. Mm -hmm. um, go did that scene have a lot of different drafts? Or Yep, yep, they all did. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, probably, uh, I'd say about, you know, 10 or 12, Wow. you know. Was developing but all the same thing, all the right. same. Jazz Club, Daniel, talk about the legend, right. you know, the turn, right. all that kind of stuff. But just, it's always massaging right. dialogue and getting, you know, the, the great lines. All I know is when I got to DreamWorks, they told me it was going to be Ben Stiller and Sam Jackson. Oh, God. Which probably would have made for a very different film. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ben was really interested in doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Ben's a great actor, and I think, right. you know, uh, that Jerry Style movie did uh, was you know amazing, and he can do it. But yeah, it's, right. it's a totally it's a totally different kind of film, isn't we're, it? We're, uh, Could have been good. I'm, right now, I'm playing the imaginary film with the two of them in my head. So. It was Jack Black to... at one stage too. <laughs> Jack Black, really? Vin Diesel, everyone. Mm -hmm. We had every director on that at one stage. We had every right. actor on that at one stage. You know, it was like you are never going to make this film.